It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. and sisters and welcome to another edition of the remnant report i am your host the remnant warrior we're going to be talking tonight about the if you haven't seen the title we're going to be talking about the persecuted church in the end times the persecuted church during the tribulation period but more than that we're going to be talking about the power of the persecuted church during the end times See, if you've been watching the Remnant Report uh, at all for the past, I don't know, six months or so, then you've heard me say and you've heard me talk about the two kingdoms because I harp on the two kingdom concept constantly. And you've heard me talk about the first, the early church, even the, the first century church, the, the church of Acts. See, guys, when the apostolic church was on this earth when the apostles and the first and even the second and third century church, when they were on this earth, the reason that they were able to work the miracles they were able to work, the reason that they were able to walk in the power and authority of Jesus Christ that they were able to walk in using the Holy Spirit power is because they had the holiness of the Holy Spirit. They actually followed the teachings of Christ and it was not just lip service to them. When they said that we will live holy and we will follow Christ, pick up our cross daily and follow Christ, and we will not deny him even unto death. It wasn't just lip service. That's the life they lived. You see, the reason why doctrines like cessationism and doctrines that take away from the power of the Holy Spirit exist here in America and here in the West by well-meaning, you know, uh, believers like Justin Peters, John MacArthur, people who truly strive at least for what we, the public, can see from their public lives. You know, we don't ever know what somebody's doing in private. If nothing else, uh, Ravi Zacharias should have taught us all that we should not put our trust and our hopes in any man. Thank you so much, Mary, for going to Facebook to share because um, I haven't been able to really share it all. I know Brianna has shared it for me, but I haven't been able to. But the only person who we can expect, the only man, woman, or human being that we could ever expect to be perfect and to look to and hold accountable as far as not expect them to fall and even have horrible skeletons in their closet is Jesus Christ. He was 100% God and 100% man, and he walked completely in the power of the Holy Spirit. Men and women today, and I'm just going to say men because I'm talking about pastors and leaders in the church, they 
cannot be, I mean, we cannot put our trust in them. We cannot look to them the way that people look to, to the leaders like Ravi Zacharias or David Jeremiah or Hal Lindsey or fill in the blank. You know, there are literally, literally tons of them, hundreds. I mean, there, there's literally hundreds. And the only one who can ever fit that bill is Jesus Christ. Now, that is fitting the bill of perfection. But when it comes to holiness, see, I know that a lot of you were probably taught the same thing I was. That because we were all born with a sinful nature, and because people like to uh, cherry pick scriptures and make doctrines, you've all heard that because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that we can never strive to be holy. We can never hope to be perfect. But you can only come up with that by cherry picking scriptures to make doctrine. And they're not doctrines, they're not biblical doctrines. They're not based on anything that was taught by Jesus Christ or the apostles. They are doctrines that men have made in order to merge the kingdom of this world with the kingdom of God to make Christianity a little easier. And, you know, I have truly, truly, I'm far from perfect, but I strive to wake up daily and take up my cross and follow Christ because I know if I don't, if I don't deny my flesh every single day, then I'll fall. I have every single time, every single time that I have not gotten up and right off the bat denied myself, denied my flesh, and took up my cross and followed the teachings of Jesus Christ, not only when I first woke up or when I first got up, but all day long. Anytime I've not done that, friends, I've fallen. And sometimes I mean fallen hard. And fallen where if, you know, people in public or, you know, the, the mainstream church knew about it, then, you know, they'd say, well, I'm never following this guy again. I'm never listening to what he says again. But the thing is, friends, you're not supposed to follow me or any other man to begin with. We are followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I know uh, I've been ranting and I'm going to stop tonight. We are going to talk about the power of the persecuted church. Now, see, the reason why it was not as hard for the first, second, and third century church to walk in the holiness of the teachings of Christ and have that Holy Spirit power is because they were under persecution. See, when the church is under persecution, the church is at its best. Now, I know that here in America that we have been taught that uh, the church shouldn't have to go through persecution because we're not appointed unto wrath. But persecution is not the wrath of God. It does not matter if it was in the first century, what the apostles lived through, or if it's the persecuted church in China and Iran and in Israel. It doesn't matter if it's them or if it's the church that will be persecuted by the Antichrist during the tribulation period. It's not the wrath of God. It is the persecution of the church by the enemy and by the world. And if you're persecuted by the world, you're persecuted by the enemy and the spirit of Antichrist. Jesus told us, he told all of us, not just his disciples, he told all of us that the world would hate us because they hated him first. He told us that rejoice. He said rejoice when men revile you or persecute you for my name's sake. Friends, do you know how gold is made pure? Through fire. It's purified by fire. Otherwise, it's got all sorts of impurities and things that make it less valuable, other types of uh, impure metals, non-precious materials. See, we as the body of Christ, the true body of Christ, and I say the true body of Christ because there are so many people, it, you know, I, I'm going to try not to get upset, but there are so many people who claim the name of Jesus Christ who would not 
no, I mean, if you ask them what it meant to be a Christian, they could not tell you. They believe because they sit in church every Sunday and they follow in the Bible to what the pastor says and they believe what the preacher has taught them that they're going to heaven. But Monday through the Sabbath day, they live like the world and the prince and ruler and God of this world. So that is why I say the true church, true believers. Because there are many, 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 many who consider themselves Christians who are not. There are even more who the world considers Christians. Because the world, anybody who wants to put the banner of Christianity over their religion, the world considers them Christians. Doesn't matter if it's the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Catholics, <laughs> the New Apostolic Reformation, the Word of Faith movement, all your charismatic genres. And, you know, I, I used to like to, to almost almost pick on the Word of Faith guys and the, the NAR guys like they were somehow uh, less worldly, I mean somehow more worldly than the Methodists or the Calvinists or the Baptists or the Evangelicals or the non-denominationals. But the fact of the matter is, friends, that the church here in America has flat out merged itself with the world. Most people, and this is, you know... A lot of times through no fault of their own, it was the way they were taught. Most people believe that there is a time to live like there's a time to be holy and godly and the time to live like the Bible tells us to. But then there's also a time for a believer to live like the world. That it's okay to live like the world Monday through Friday sometimes. And they might, these might be, you know, your deacons. These might even be. People who are pastors. But because for whatever reason, whether they have another job or they have something else like a hobby that requires them to intermingle themselves with the world, then they believe that when they're at work, it's okay to have that capitalist mindset. And, you know, they might be the deacon of the church and they might uh, have won so many people to the Lord. But then when they're at work and they uh, get this big business deal, it's okay to lie and cheat the competition because that's what capitalism here in America has taught us. And I know a lot of people are going to hear me say that and say, oh, this guy is some socialist, uh, democratic leftist. Nah, uh-uh. See, I am neither one because, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. You, I love all of you. This is why I am starting this program out saying this because I love each and every one of you. Even if I've never met you, I love you, and I don't want you to be misled. Now, there is no room, no room for the things of this world in, the, in the, any one of the followers of Christ. There is no room to lie, cheat, steal. There is no time that that is okay. I don't care what your job is. If your job requires you to do these types of things, then I would suggest you seriously think about what's more important to you. Because I can tell you what our jobs are supposed to be. And see, we've been taught here in America that separation of church and state means something totally different than it was supposed to mean when it was said by the first person who ever said it, and that was Jesus Christ. Jesus taught separation of church and state, true separation of church and state, the state being the world. He taught the separation of the kingdoms. Now I'm going to tell you something, and then I'm going to dive into the study tonight. But in the first century church, in the apostolic church, the church of Acts, the second century church, and all the way up until the church stopped being persecuted because it was when the church got a break when believers stopped being persecuted and the devil saw that uh, the harder that he fought against these people physically the stronger they got spiritually the more that he killed them the more they grew the more he persecuted them the more power and authority they had so instead of coming at them physically through men the devil does what the devil does, and that's adapt. And 
he said, if I can't beat them, I'll join them. In other words, I'm going to infiltrate. And he stopped fighting a spiritual battle with physical weapons. See, that's what the devil was doing in the first century. And even when he wasn't, he could not come against the church, the apostles, or even the average believer with spiritual weapons in that day because in that day, they walked in the power of the Holy Spirit with the whole armor of God. And there was no power and no weapon formed against them would prosper. But, see, the devil knew in order to be able to do that, he had to infiltrate the church and get them, just like in the Old Testament. When Israel sinned, when they fell into sin, that is when they were able to be beaten and come under the judgment of God. The exact same thing happened in the Israel of God, the church, the kingdom of God. And that is, the devil stopped physically persecuting the church. And he even uh, gave them a champion in the emperor Constantine. And more and more worldly-minded leaders came into the church bringing in... Uh, compromising doctrines, because that's where it started. It didn't start with uh, the Roman Catholic heresy that there is today, or the Roman Catholic heresy that was all through the Middle Ages, or the Dark Ages. No, it started with compromise. It started by mixing the kingdom of the world with the kingdom of God. Because before the compromise, during the first, second, and third century, it was, if you were in the government, if you, if you, if you were, say, uh, a mayor, a senator, a governor, a president, if you had a job in the government, a congressman, you were not getting baptized. They wouldn't baptize you. You would not be allowed into the church. Guess what else? If you were a soldier, you would not join the church. They would not allow it. They kept the kingdoms separate. The things that Jesus Christ taught against, they made sure that nobody living those types of lifestyles were allowed to join the church. Now, if they repented, left those lifestyles like many, many, many did, then they were allowed to join the church. And that is how the first century, first and second century church, and even the third century, turned the world upside down by not compromising. But, friends, once you start compromising, it only goes downhill from there. And that's what happened. Now, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want you to turn with me to, first of all, I want to go to the book of Revelation. We're going to go to the book of Revelation, and we're going to actually read uh, several things in Revelation, but I want to start off by looking at Revelation chapter 1. We're going to start in chapter 1, and I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I want to show some things. I'm going to go 1, 2, and 3. And I want to show you guys some things. Um, You know, the last program was about the restrainer of lawlessness and the identity of the restrainer of lawlessness and the three aspects of the Antichrist. And you can find that program. It's audio teaching only. You can find it in three different places. You can find it on YouTube, on Facebook, or you can find it uh, in the audio podcast version, which is on just about any and everywhere that that podcasts are found. about the only place it's not is iHeartRadio, and I'll never put my podcast on iHeartRadio. Uh, anyways, I want to take just a second to show you guys something and talk about something. First of all, last week's program on the restrainer, I used a lot of resources for the information that I got for last week's program. Of course, the Bible being the main one. But Every resource that I used to come up with what I came up with can be found in this book. It's called The Revelation Revolution by Dr. Dennis James Woods. And I know that this is probably backwards because it's uh, you know, on camera, so it probably is not mirrored or probably is mirrored. But this is uh, Dr. Woods. Is, um, it's a series. It's the End Times Apologetic Series, Volume 1. Revelation Revolution, The Antichrist, Angels, and the Abyss. And... Guys, this is one of the best books that I have read on the tribulation in a long time. And I'm sure the entire series will be that way. Um, it is, I mean, there, there are some things in it 
that I don't completely agree with, but they are very minor things, and they are things that nobody is sure on. The things that can be found in Scripture, the things that everybody can be certain about, all of it is accurate in this book, and I agree with it 100%. Now, I am going to uh, leave a link in on the YouTube channel for uh, where you can find this book. I'm going to take these off because they're, quite frankly, hurting my ears, and my microphone is right here anyway, so it's not going to hurt anything uh, for me not to have those on. Um, I, uh, I hope that you guys will go to the link that I put in the description of the YouTube, and I, I'll put it in the comments on Facebook as well, but I hope that you guys will go and order a copy of this book because it is truly, truly an amazing book. And with the times that we are living in, and this is, you know, this is probably going to shock a lot of you, but I would rather you go and buy Dr. Woods' book than buy my own. You know, I, I truly would. I, I could care less about selling books. Um, I really don't care if another one of mine sells as long as I can get you people to see the truth of the two kingdoms. Now, the reason why Dr. Woods' book is important in regards to the two kingdoms is because one of the, one of the very, very horrible doctrines of men that was brought into the church by men trying to join the two kingdoms is dispensationalism. And a little, nowadays it's even kind of, uh, well, you know, doctrines change over time. Dispensationalism is not necessarily all that it was when uh, it was first created, but this book, you know, it, it, will, it, it will tell you, you know, what you need to know about how dispensationalism got started, when it got started. Um, you know, the different people who have promoted the doctrine of dispensationalism. And when I say dispensationalism, although there are many things wrong with the entire doctrine of dispensationalism, the doctrine that I'm talking about most is pre-trib, pre-trib rapture, the pre-trib rapturism and you know i know that's not really a word but the pre-trib rapture doctrine comes right out of dispensationalism uh there may have been those a little before darby started um well darby and the plymouth brethren a lot of you guys uh may or may not know who the plymouth brethren were well darby was a member of the Plymouth Brethren, and dispensationalism was a doctrine held by the Plymouth Brethren. Now, eventually, dispensationalism and even pre, uh, pre-tribism was rejected by some in the uh, Plymouth Brethren, but for the most part, and definitely in the beginning, it wasn't. It was received. And that doctrine, as I said last week, it literally, brothers and sisters, it is setting the church up for the great falling away that Second Thessalonians talks about. I covered all of that last week, but it is literally setting up the same problem that the church in Thessalonica was having. See, somebody, somebody in the guise of, a, of an apostle, somebody wrote them a letter saying that the day of the Lord had already come and that they had, in a sense, the same thing that's going to happen when the tribulation actually begins. All of the people who I call your modern day Thessalonians, they are going to believe that the day of the Lord has already happened and that they've missed it and that they are indeed not believers, that they are lost because, and they may be lost, but regardless, they're going to fall away because they are going to think that the day of the Lord has happened. And of course, we know that we, you know, in First Thessalonians, Paul tells us that believers, we are not appointed to wrath. God has not appointed us unto wrath. And dispensationalism and pre see there are a lot of other um like for instance calvinist uh there's a lot wrong with calvinism the entire tulip doctrine is um at least the the way it was when um john calvin and others uh first came up with it it uh went completely against what the apostles and the early church fathers taught 
if you don't know what TULIP is, uh, it is a, uh, each letter stands for a word that forms the doctrine for Calvinism. Now, I'm not going to get off on the rabbit trail and go over TULIP, but I will tell you to go to the Omega Frequency on YouTube, or you can go to um, Reclaiming the Faith. On, uh, it's on the Apple App Store and or the Apple Podcast Store, or iTunes, I think is what it's called. I'm not an iPhone guy. I have never owned an iPhone in my life. But I know that Phil Baker's show, Reclaiming the Faith, is a part of Omega Frequency. So you can find it on the Omega Frequency YouTube channel, or you can find it on wherever you find podcasts like iTunes and you know the different places, Spreaker, Spotify, all the different podcast places, Podbean. And Phil Baker did a three-part series on the tulip doctrine versus the early church and you know he actually had to do a three-part series three different episodes they're about 30 minutes each 25 to 30 minutes each that cover these doctrines and it also shows how they do not line up with not only what the early church taught because the early church is not where we get our doctrine from the only reason why we look to the early church is because they were taught by the apostles, and almost every time, they've gotten it right. So, although you're probably not going to go wrong if you are following the teachings of the early church fathers, that is not what we do. We look to Scripture as our ultimate teacher. Jesus Christ is our teacher. He is our rabbi. He's the only rabbi. Now, Revelation. I got off on the rabbit trail, and I hate doing that. Got off on another rant. But Revelation chapter 1, this is, of course, a lot of people, try. To, they, they tend to stay away from this book. And you shouldn't. Now, if you're going to read Revelation, you need to put out of your mind any and everything that you have ever been taught by any of your, I don't care if it was your preacher growing up or your favorite prophecy pundit or your favorite uh Radio preacher, whoever it is, forget about what they taught you and read Revelation as if you've never read it before with the Holy Spirit and the rest of the Bible as your guide. And this is something that we should do because we are told in Revelation at the end of the book, God tells us that there is a special blessing. It's, this is not said in any other book of the Bible, but in the book of Revelation, it says at the end, that there is a special blessing to those who read and keep the sayings that are in this book. It says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through enter in through the gates into the city. Da -da -da -da. I may not be. Yeah, I am. Okay, here we go. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He that testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, the words that are spoken in verses 18 and 19 of Revelation 22 should be the scariest most heart-stopping words of that any of the prophecy pundits and anyone who is teaching doctrines that either add or take away from the prophecies in this book. Now, that is why when teaching this book, or you know, I've never taught it, when preaching this book, when reading this book, when helping others understand this book, I have always been very quick to say, especially early on in my ministry when I um, didn't know as much about 
revelation as I uh, know now that I definitely didn't know it all, that I had my opinions, but that the things that I was saying was, thus saith Jeremy, not thus saith the Lord. Now, when something is not a theory, when something is not my opinion, when it is fact, cold hard facts, then I am quick to point that out too. I think I did that last week. I think I made it very clear that the restrainer of lawlessness is an angel. The restrainer of lawlessness is an angel using a chain and the abyss or the bottomless pit. That is cold hard fact from the Bible, from the book of Revelation. Now, I went a little further than that and I gave my opinion that that angel is the archangel Michael. And I even showed the scriptures uh, that make me believe that. But that is opinion and my theory. Now, Revelation chapter 1 is the preface of the book, so to speak. Uh, it's the coming of Christ. It is uh, the revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ or the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And it says in the beginning here in chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth. See, here's the blessing. I read you the curse. Here's the blessing. I should have read this part first, but I wanted to show that it was the, that although there's a blessing and that we should read this book, we have to be very careful because there is a curse. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people are scared and stay away from it because of the curses that are at the end of the book. But friends, if you just stick to the doctrine of Christ and stick to the text and quit worrying about a man's interpretation of it, then you don't have anything to worry about. If you're reading and studying with the Holy Spirit, you're not teaching this anyway. You are studying to show yourself approved. But verse number three says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, those who read this book are blessed, and those who hear the book read are blessed. Now, Jesus, he literally cared so much about us knowing what is going to happen in the tribulation period and during the last days of this earth. He wanted us to know so bad that he sent his most beloved disciple, John, 2,000 years into the future to see and write these things down. Now, of course, a lot of things that John was seeing in this, you know, 2,000 years in the future, he could not understand, so he wrote them down the best he could. But I think a lot of things are written down just the way they are, that he understood them fine. We're talking about John the Revelator. We're talking about the Apostle John who had the angel there with him to tell him the mysteries of the, the beast and the woman and all of the other things. So I don't think there were many things that he didn't understand. Maybe some things like technology that he was seeing happen. But for the most part, I have to believe that John understood it. And Jesus sent John to forewarn us. But here in the very beginning of Revelation, when this book was written, this is what I like to call the twofold part of Revelation, the twofold fulfillment and the twofold meaning. And even in the cases of the churches that I'm about to read the letters to, it would definitely be a twofold meaning, but also a twofold fulfillment because he was talking, John was talking to seven specific actual churches that, are, that were in Asia and they were there at that time, real people. And Jesus was telling Paul, I mean, telling John what to tell them because guess what? They were living in tribulation. John says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, 
Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now, there is so much that I can unpack just from that little bit of scripture. So much that people have made doctrines out of. So much that people don't understand. And so much that people do understand. And I'm going to tell you something. If you take it exactly like it says, if you don't try to add to it or take away from it, then you will know exactly what it says and what it means. Now, Revelation is a book that talks in allegory and a book that talks in symbols, but you can usually tell when it's using allegory and symbolism and when it's not. Now, one of the doctrines that have really thrown people off and made people believe the lies of things like preterism and dispensationalism is either that all of the things in Revelation were fulfilled by 70 A.D. because the things that are written in this book were written only to these seven churches. That's one of the lies and one of the doctrines of men. And also dispensationalism, which says that these churches are not actual churches, but church ages that are in the future. They are different church ages. That's dispensationalism. And I'm here to tell you that these were actual churches. Although we all can probably find something in common with these churches in churches throughout the world, throughout history, during the past 2,000 years, the fact remains that these churches, the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, 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 Philadelphia, and Laodicea were actual churches. And there was a letter written to each of them. Now, I think that there is definitely something that we can get in the last days because there is definitely churches exactly like this all throughout the world in the last days. But you see, there is one specific church that we are fixing to focus on because there is one specific church that I think the, tri the tribulation church, the saints during the last days will be able to most, we will have the most in common with and we will be able to relate to the most. And that is the church of Smyrna. Now, I want to read you this. I want to turn to Revelation chapter number 7. Yeah, verse number seven. We're going to start with verse number 7 of chapter 2. And it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. See, they're going to suffer. It's like we're going to suffer. This was an actual church in the first century. This was an actual church. This actually wasn't the first century. Mm, yeah, I guess this was the end of the first century uh, when this was written. So this was the apostolic church, the church in the time of Acts, a little after. And Jesus is saying to them, I know thy works. So... They obviously have works. They are following the commandments of Jesus Christ, what he taught, and they are working out their salvation. 
and also their tribulation and poverty. See, even though these guys were in poverty, Jesus tells them that they are rich. That would not fly here in America, friends, especially, and, and not just with the prosperity preachers, not just with the prosperity preachers. Your average deacon on the church pew and even church member makes between fifty and five hundred thousand dollars a year. Now, is that poverty stricken? No. Now, am I telling you that you're not a Christian if you make money? No, I'm not. But I am telling you, plain and simple, that there is more said about being rich and money than almost anything else in the teachings of Jesus as far as what not to be like, what not to do. You know, Jesus says that it's easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into heaven. It also says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The root of all evil is the love of money. So I'm not bashing people who have money at all. I'm just saying that money and capitalism is a, can become and is an idol for many, many, many who claim the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus says here again unto the church in Smyrna, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, Jesus actually talks about this synagogue of Satan twice here in his letters to the churches. And I think the synagogue of Satan is, you know, a lot of people... And I used to be one of those people believe that the synagogue of Satan is only talking about the uh, religion of Judaism and, you know, the Kabbalistic Jews. I definitely agree that it is talking about those people, the Pharisees and those who practice the doctrine and religion of the Pharisees. But it's also talking about spiritual Jews. It's also talking about spiritual Israel, those who claim to be in the church, but do lie. They're not. Because, friends, when Jesus wrote this, Israel was a spiritual kingdom. And the only way to enter it and be the chosen of the Lord was by accepting Jesus Christ. And for the most part, the physical Israel, physical Israel, rejected and even had Jesus crucified. So they would have had to have been grafted back in the same as the Gentiles were grafted in. There was only one way to enter into Israel. So it's definitely talking about ethnic Jewish people who are practicing in the synagogue, so to speak. But it's also talking about those who say they are spiritual Israelites, those who say they are believers but are lying. And they're actually of the synagogue of Satan. They're actually, now who, the synagogue of Satan, you know, I wrote a chapter in my first book that was all about how the synagogue of Satan was the Kabbalistic Judaism. Because there's only one religion that has a synagogue and that's who Jesus was talking about. It's the religion of the Pharisees and this, that, and third. But a lot of you know that I have uh, rewritten the first edition of my book, and I have edited a lot of it. And in the second revised edition, I changed a lot in that chapter. And although I still leave the synagogue of Satan as rabbinic Judaism, I also add into it the apostate church. Because the apostate church is also the synagogue of Satan. Because the god of this world is who? Satan. So... The church or synagogue of, this, of, of the world, the churches of the world who have mixed in the kingdom of the world and the practices of the world in with the kingdom of God, they are literally following the God of this world who is Satan. So they are also just as much the synagogue of Satan. Now, Jesus says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Fear not. Listen, listen, behold the devil. Now, when he says the devil here, he's talking about two things. First of all, remember what I said in the beginning of the program, that the first century church, they were, the devil through men persecuted them constantly. 
physically. They were thrown to lions. They were crucified. They were stoned. They were killed in all horrible manners, in all sorts of horrible, just ways that you don't even want to imagine dying, the things that they suffered. I would imagine that some of them probably knew what Jesus suffered. Now, especially the crucifixion part, not the taking on the sins of the world part, but the actual physical pain. Now, Jesus says, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. So he's literally saying that they are going to be cast into prison by the devil. The devil was using physical means to persecute them. But this is also, again, that twofold meaning to prophecy. This is also talking to the end times church, the last days church, the church during the tribulation. And who is, who gives the Antichrist his power? The dragon, right? The devil. So brothers and sisters, he's also talking about those in the end times who will literally be persecuted and cast into prison by the devil, by the Antichrist, by the beast. And it says, some of you in, cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, there are other churches that are mentioned after the church of Smyrna. But the church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia are the only two churches who Jesus has nothing bad to say about in his letters. Now, I believe 110% that the church of Philadelphia and the church of Smyrna, although they were actual churches that this letter was written to, they also represent the saints of God, the true church during the tribulation. They represent Two different types of believers in the end times. Those who will literally live to see the second coming of Christ and those who won't. Because we know that there are both. There are those who will be alive all the way up until the rapture. We find that out with Paul. I hate using the word rapture because there's so much uh, misunderstanding about that word. And it's not even a biblical word. But the catching up, the Second coming where the, I tell you what, this is what it's called, the resurrection. There are those that are going to live to the resurrection. And, you know, Paul talked about it. He said that those who sleep will be caught up and those who are alive will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air when he comes back. Now, again, the adding to the book and taking away from it, you're doing both when you say that, Jesus is going to come twice because that is what dispensationalism in the preacher of rapture teaches. It teaches that Jesus comes halfway down, but doesn't quite, uh, you know, touch his feet on the earth. And the rapture happens. And then he comes back again at however many years later, uh, seven years later, according to dispensationalism and preacher of rapturism. And he comes back then and the battle of Armageddon wipes out all of the soldiers that are fighting with the beast and he throws the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire and that is adding and taking away both from the prophecies in this book. Jesus is only, he, he only comes twice. His first coming where he came as 100% man and 100% God, born of a virgin to be the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and then when he comes again to judge this world and to resurrect his bride. He comes back for his bride, both living and dead, sleep and awake. And that is the two churches here, Philadelphia and Smyrna. They were actual churches, but they were also, they are also representatives of the churches who will be in the end times, or the believers, the church in the end times. Now, these other churches, do they represent actual believers? Yes, because these were actual churches in the first century as well. And all of, and it also represents churches throughout history, and I believe also in the end times, because you've got actual believers 
in all of these different churches, all of these different denominational churches, evangelical churches. You've got actual believers in these churches. But there are also people who need to repent. And I think that everyone who would say that there's no way to lose your salvation and that believe this once saved, always saved fallacy, you should read the red letters of the Bible, of the New Testament, both in the Gospels and in Revelation. Because Jesus is very clear, especially here in Revelation. He's talking to the church here, the churches. And he says several times, except thou repent, I will remove thy candlestick. He says this to, let's see, he's talking to the church at Ephesus. And he says, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars and in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which are the seven churches. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and hast not fainted. Now, we know that the church of Ephesus was a true church because Paul wrote uh, a letter to the Ephesians. So, you know, this is actually one of the churches that Paul started, and it was a real first century church. But although Jesus says all of these things to them, praising them, he then says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. What are the first works? What they did when they first entered into the kingdom. They followed the commands and teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells them to follow, repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. Does he say, I will come unto thee quickly and take your life and you'll lose your crown in heaven? You know, you just won't have all your rewards in heaven. Is that what he says? No. He says, I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place. The candlesticks literally represent the churches. He's telling them as plain as he could possibly tell them, repent or else. He says that, that this thou hast, that ye hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So Jesus is praising them and chastising them. What's up, AJ? What's up, everybody watching? I uh, really got into uh, my rant at the beginning and then the, the teaching and the word, and I just... Man, I completely forgot to say hey to everyone. Thank everybody for watching. And uh, I apologize for that. I, um, I'm glad that all of you are here with me. And uh, I hope that if you weren't able to watch from the beginning, that you go back after the show's over and you'll watch from the beginning all the way to the end. But Jesus says this same type thing to a lot of the churches, to five out of the seven. There's only two churches, and that is, of course, the church of Smyrna and then the church of Philadelphia. And he says to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right, the, and this is verse 7 of chapter 3, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. And has kept my word, and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Now I want to show you something here. The reason why I'm telling you that the church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia both represent real churches, but also the church during the last days, during the tribulation. I'm going to show you these things that Jesus says only to these two churches. Again, talking about both the Synagogue of Satan, as in the rabbinic Jews, the Kabbalistic Jews that are practicing a mockery of what was originally the worship of the Father. They literally have done the same thing that the churches, those who have mixed the world into the church in Christianity, they've done the same thing. But they've gone farther. They've just rejected Jesus Christ outright. But what did Jesus say to the church of Laodicea? They 
were neither cold nor hot, remember? At least, and he says because of that, he will spew them out of his mouth. But at least the Jews, the Kabbalistic Jews, be they the synagogue of Satan or not, they are at least cold. They at least rejected him then and now. But the church of Philadelphia, like the church of Smyrna, Jesus says, I know thy works and have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Well, the way that the end times church overcomes the dragon is by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The Antichrist, the beast of Revelation, the first beast of Revelation 13, is literally going to kill the believers who will not deny the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the church of Philadelphia, both the original, the true church, the actual church in the first century, they kept the words, the teachings of Jesus Christ, and they did not deny his name. So Jesus says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Jesus literally is saying two things here. He's talking about the separation of the wheat and the chaff, and the chaff at the judgment. But he's also, also talking about his ethnic Jewish people, the people who were God's chosen in the beginning. They were the election by birth. And then they rejected Jesus Christ. So for that reason, they say they are Jews, just like those in the apostate church say they are Christians, which is the same thing, uh, part of the Israel of God. See, we like to believe that there's a difference between Israel and the church, but there's not. Israel and the church are the same. Now, because of that, Jesus says that he is going to make them know that he has, he said, I will make them know that I have loved thee. In other words, he is going to show the people who rejected him, be it because they rejected him as the Messiah and they were uh, born into Israel, or be it because they are in the church and rejected him by rejecting his teachings and rejecting his commandments, thereby denying his name. He says that he is going to make them come and worship at their feet. Now, Jesus says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. Now, a lot of people like to, and I know that there are a lot of people who don't agree with me on this, um, even people who teach the two kingdoms. Uh, you know, I've had discussions with them, people that I love and call brother, who disagree with me on this. But who I see when I'm looking at the end times church of Philadelphia, I see the 144,000. That's who I see. I, I think that it's not an actual number, that it is a representation of the saints of God who will literally be here until the second coming. And the reason they're going to be here is because they are they are Jews. The Bible says, that, you know, later on in Revelation, and we're going to get to that here in a minute, it talks about the, the virgins, how they are from each of the tribes and how they've not lain with women. They are, you know, virgins and whatnot. But there's nothing, nothing. I, I can also show you, I'm not going to tonight because I'm not teaching on the 144,000, but I can show you uh, just as much in the other parts of the New Testament that show, and the Old Testament for that matter, that shows that once you are 
yeah, once you come into the kingdom of God, this is the concept of being born again, right? And grafted in. But now that Israel is a spiritual kingdom and you are born again into it, spiritually born again, then you are literally a spiritual virgin. And as long as you... Now, I don't believe that everybody who is a believer... Like I said, there are two different groups of believers that I see in the uh, tribulation period. And I think they're represented here by those in the church of Smyrna and those in the church of Philadelphia. Now, you could also say that there are some in the other churches those who repent. But once they repent, then they would be in one church or the other. They would be in the kingdom of God. There is only one kingdom of God. These were different churches, just like we have... That just means different congregations. The church is the body of Christ. These were different congregations. In five of these congregations, there were apostate people, apostate Christians, if you will, and apostate doctrines... And Jesus tells them that if they don't repent, then he's going to take their name out of the book, that he's going to take away their candlestick. He tells them that, let's see, uh, the church of Sardis, he says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, Jesus talked about that in his teachings. When he taught about, you know, those who would be taken by surprise by his return. And, you know, that's another way that it's added to and taken away from by the pre-trib dispensationalists. Because they teach that uh, this is the rapture. And it's not. But... I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time on this. So I'm just going to say that each one of these churches represent a congregation, both in the first century, and you might as well you can say all through history. But the two churches that are literally shown to be and called the elect, Jesus has nothing bad to say about them, are Smyrna and Philadelphia, and we know that there are those who will be killed. The only way that they are going to overcome the dragon and those who are Jews and say those who say they are Jews and are not but do lie is literally through death by the blood of the lamb is the only thing the, the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony they have to love not their lives even unto death that happened in the first century and it's going to happen again in the tribulation but we also see believers who are going to make it throughout the entire tribulation. Now, a lot of people will say that these are, and this is especially a dispensational point of view, that these are these 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Well, I disagree, and I have very good reasons, both from the early church fathers and the Bible itself, and the Bible is our ultimate source of truth and our our last stop for what we believe in our doctrine. Now, you know, I even know that uh, BDK, you know, does not agree with me on this, and that's okay. And when I say does not agree with me, I mean he does not agree with me that the 144,000 are the same as the Church of Philadelphia, but that's okay. Um, I think it's easy to see, whether you agree with that or not, that the other thing that I've said about the Church of Philadelphia is 100% true and not a theory. It was an actual church in the first century and is also a church, a, a group of believers that will make it until the very end of the tribulation period, the return of Christ. We know that there will be those alive that see him in all his glory that are believers. We know that there will be those alive who uh, aren't followers of Christ. The Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess when he returns. But... I want to go now to the book of Revelation chapter 13. And I want to see for just a little while this persecution that is going to take place. I've shown you guys how it was done. I started this program off talking about the way that the first century church, the church of Acts, the first and second century church, 
They walked in the power of the Holy Spirit because they were holy. They were holy and they were also persecuted. The more they were persecuted, the more they were holy. And that's because they considered themselves worthy. They considered it a privilege to be worthy enough to die for the name of Christ, the cause of Christ. I misspoke. I meant to say they considered it a privilege to be considered worthy enough to die for the name of Christ and to not reject the cause and name of Christ and the teachings of Christ. But here in Revelation 13, we see this beast, this Antichrist, that's going to rise up out of the sea. The first beast is going to rise up out of the sea or out of the nations. And it says here, and I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Now, we are literally seeing, we talked about this in the last program, we're seeing, first of all, the first aspect of the beast is the kingdom aspect. And this beast is going to be given his kingdom and his great authority from the god of this world or the dragon, Satan. And the second aspect of this beast is this man that rises out of the nations, that rises out of this kingdom to rule this one world kingdom because in the end times, and this is what I wanted to point out. This was the big point I wanted to make tonight. This is the reason why the church will be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit during the tribulation, the same as they were in the book of Acts. And this is why I pray to God that I will be allowed to live until this time and considered worthy enough to be one of these tribulation saints. Because during the tribulation, and the tribulation is the tribulation of the church. During the tribulation, the world will finally, finally be two separate kingdoms. One kingdom of the world under one world government and one kingdom of believers, kingdom of God. It will literally be the two kingdoms. There will be no mixing of the world and the church. No. The believers, yes, we will be persecuted, but we will once again be purified by the fire of that persecution. And just like the first century believers, just like the second century believers, we will grow stronger and stronger in that Holy Spirit power, and we will be able to fight the war of the end times of tribulation, the true war, which is the spiritual war. And those, whether you want to believe that the 144,000 are actual ethnic Jews or you believe, as I do, that it is representative of those who follow the teachings of Christ, who have been following the teachings of Christ, not start once they see that the tribulation has happened. You see, once the tribulation has happened, once the church is being persecuted, brothers and sisters, there's only going to be two kingdoms then. There's only going to be two kingdoms. And I wish we had time because I'd take you to Revelation chapter 6 and I'd show you, you know, this great multitude that appears in heaven from all of the uh, believers who are martyred for the cause in the name of Christ. And I would make a doggone good case for them being the church of Smyrna believers in the tribulation. And then the 144,000 being the Church of Philadelphia, but whether or not, I mean, that, that, I will say that is a theory of mine. That is not uh, biblical truth, and I am not adding to this book or taking away from it. I'm giving you my theory on that aspect of end times Bible prophecy. Now, the fact is, there will be these believers who have been separate from the world, who have kept the name of and the teachings of God have not denied his name and have kept his commandments. And because of that, those of the synagogue of Satan are going to be made 
to come and worship at their feet. In my opinion, these people are going to walk in that Holy Spirit power and authority. Now, I wish we had time to go through all of what the church is going to go through during the tribulation and be able to see some of the different things that we have to look for in the future. And like I said, some of them are things to look forward to depending on how you're looking at it. If you're looking at it from a worldly point of view, it, it probably sounds horrible to you. And a dispensational pre-trib point of view is a worldly point of view because that's a man-made doctrine, plain and simple. A man made up the doctrine of the secret pre-trib rapture. It was not something that was inspired by the Holy Spirit and put down in Scripture. So when you are following that worldly doctrine, then you are definitely being led astray. Now, there are those who are rejecting that doctrine. And the more and more we, come, we see things and the closer and closer that we get to this prophecy being fulfilled, the more prophecy we see being fulfilled and the closer we get to this end time period of tribulation, which there is a good argument that can be made for the tribulation already starting. You know, um, people think that 2 Thessalonians is all about, or, or what Paul is talking about in 2 Thessalonians 2 is, all, is about the entire tribulation period. But the Thessalonians, they weren't worried that they had missed the rapture. They had been told and they were worried that the day of the Lord had happened. And we know that the day of the Lord is what? The day of the Lord is at the wrath. It's when the wrath is poured out. Well, Paul talks in 2 Thessalonians about the revealing of the Antichrist. He doesn't call him the Antichrist. He calls him the man of lawlessness or the man of sin. And he talks about the restrainer being removed. We covered all of this last week. Now, there is something that you all need to understand. And that is that the tribulation could have started already. The Antichrist does not have to be in his second or even third aspect for the tribulation to have started. The tribulation starts with all of the things that Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 and the things that we see in the beginning of Revelation. We can literally see the tribulation starting. Now, it starts with the writers, right? And the, the trumpets. Now, in Thessalonians, in chapter 2, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him. This is not talking about the beginning of the tribulation here. It's talking about the second coming. It says, That ye be not shewn, shaken in mind, or be tro troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The day of the Lord shall not come, except there first come a falling away, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. So when Paul was with them, he literally told them who the restrainer was. And, he's, and what was being restrained, which was the man of sin. Paul tells them that for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, or he who restraineth will now restrain. Until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. With all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness 
of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receiveth not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. That is literally what is going to happen when believers all over the world start realizing that they are in the tribulation. And I truly believe that if we are not already in the tribulation, we will be shortly. I really, if I had to, if somebody, you know, uh, pressed me on it and made me say yay or nay, I would have to say I believe that the tribulation has begun. And uh, I will say this, that I will be able to know for sure and give a better answer in the next few years for sure. Um, I even have a very good idea of who I think the, uh, at least the first two aspect, well, I, I, we all know um, that the third aspect of the beast will rise out of the abyss, out of the pit, and this spirit is going to enter into a man and like the first world leader, See, the, all the world was gathered under one government and one world leader once before. This has happened before. It was in Babylon. It was before the Tower of Babel, during the Tower, Tower of Babel. And this one world leader, this original Antichrist or original beast or one world leader, there's no other way to put it. This king, his name was Nimrod. And so, just like in those days, see, the Bible says that Nimrod literally began to be a Giborim. He began to be a mighty one, even a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, this could be exactly what we can say about what is going to happen to this man who will be the next Nimrod, the next one world leader. He is going to be the king of all the world. And he is going to unite the world once again. The world is going to be united under one leader. And I have a very good opinion on who that will be. Um, I am definitely not going to tell you, so, uh, at least not on the show, so don't ask in the comments. Uh, if you want to talk about it with me privately, you can message me and uh, I can uh, give you my uh, belief on that and I can tell you why. And I can tell you how I will know for sure, and how you can know for sure too, soon. If certain things happen that <clears throat> a certain group of people and a certain letter of the alphabet keeps saying is going to happen, you know, they are still saying it's going to happen. And all of these uh, false prophets prophesied about this person. I could see how... Um, if things happen the way that this person's followers still believe and are saying is going to happen, how it could definitely be that way. Uh, at least, you know, he would not have any of that uh, satanic power, but he would be the second aspect, the, the, the human man aspect of the Antichrist until whoever he is, until he is indwelled by the spirit from the abyss. And guys, when he is indwelled by the spirit from the abyss, when he is literally become a Nephilim king, he may not be a Nephilim in the sense that 
the Nephilim from Genesis 6 were Nephilim between the mating of an angel and a human, but he could definitely be considered a Nephilim because he will have the spirit of one of these Nephil, uh, Nephilim, the fallen ones, or Watcher, you know, who knows? I know that they are the ones that are in the abyss, um, which takes us back. I'm telling you, go listen to last week's program. I talked about the different ways and the dual fulfillment of he that was of old, is not, and will be again when he rises out of the abyss, that spiritual aspect of the beast. It, you, it, I mean, it shows you clearly that this was an entity from old times, ancient times, who was, but was put in the abyss, so is not right now as far as on this earth, but will rise out of the abyss again and indwell this man. So in that sense, it will be a Nephilim, a hybrid, 100%. Now, when this man is indwelled by this fallen spirit, the persecution of the church will be turned up to a degree and a level that truly has never been seen even in the first century, or at least not since the first and second century, because even the, the church that is persecuted in China and Iran, although it is absolutely 100% for sure that they are in tribulation, I believe that that is mild compared to what the Antichrist is going to do to those who do not take the mark of the beast, to those who do not bow down to the image, to those that do not reject the name of Jesus Christ. And we can literally see these things happening in the book of Revelation. Now, I am getting ready to close up, but I want to show you something. Those in Revelation chapter, in Revelation chapter 12, when it's talking about the dragon, Satan being cast down to the earth, it says, when he was cast out into the earth, it says he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10 of chapter 12 says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore, rejoice, ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Okay? That is talking about the people who are in heaven. The people who have already been martyred, or however you want to say it. it said, this is right here where it says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The blood of the Lamb is, you know, of course, how Jesus' blood overcomes, I mean, covers our sins, and our testimony of our salvation in Jesus Christ, our testimony of Jesus Christ is how we overcome him by loving not our lives unto the death. That is, everybody from the time that the church was first began all the way until now or even later than now, the, the tribulation period, you might as well say. Because you see... It says here in the very next verse, woe, or in the second half of verse 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman. And, you know, this is literally when the persecution of the last day's church will begin. Satan has had access to the throne of God. He has been able to accuse the brethren day, or night, uh, day and night. But, of course, we know that we have an adversary in Jesus Christ. We have one who overcomes the accusations of the accuser. And he is going to be cast down to the earth to where he can no longer accuse the brethren anymore. 
But when that time happens, he is going to persecute the saints in a way that he has not done probably ever. I would venture to say the church has never been persecuted this way. Because at Calvary, Satan was bound to an extent. You know, he, he, what Jesus Christ did on the cross dealt a blow to the head of the devil and literally bound him. And he did not have the same power anymore. That's why we live in the age of grace. And when he is cast down to the earth, it says the dragon was wroth with the woman. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is literally, literally talking about the church. The remnant of her seed. This is not an ethnic seed. This is a spiritual people. This is not an ethnic people. I'm sure there will be, there definitely will be ethnic uh, Jewish people in this remnant, but there will also be those in this remnant who have all different kinds of blood, and it is a spiritual kingdom. It is about keeping the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we can't just be talking about the physical, because do the physical have the testimony of Jesus Christ? No, they rejected and to this day reject Jesus Christ. Now, the dispensational doctrine, again, teaches that this is the time when all Israel will be saved, that the persecution here is against, is God's wrath on the world. And all of these things are happening to make Israel turn back to God, that God has taken his focus off of the church and put it back on Israel. That is 100% false. That is one of the biggest lies of dispensationalism. It's another reason why I would be extremely scared to be a dispensationalist pastor teaching prophecy because you are not teaching it as theory. Dispensational pre-tribism is not taught as a theory anymore. It's taught as fact. And that is adding to and taking away from. That is getting <laughs> all the curses from this book added on to you and your name taken from the book of life. Now, that's Revelation 12, and Revelation 13, as we started talking about earlier, is when the beast rises out of the sea. He gets his deadly head wound, and his wound is healed. The world wonders after the beast, and then they start worshiping the dragon who gave power to the beast. And they worshiped also the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now we see right here, this is one of the things that the Apostle Paul talked about in 2 Thessalonians that must happen. We see the abomination of desolation talked about by Jesus Christ and also by the prophet Daniel. And in verse number 7 it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him except for those whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Those whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, they will all worship the beast. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Now, brothers and sisters, the things that you have heard me say here tonight, if you have been taught the dispensational pre-trib point of view, then either you disagree with me completely or you see the truth in what I'm saying and it may scare you to death. I want to remind you and take you back to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Jesus says right here to the church of Smyrna, he says, 
fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. We don't have to fear. We are not supposed to fear him that can kill the body. We should fear God who can destroy both body and soul. If we confess his name before men, then Jesus will confess our name before his father and before his angels. If we overcome, we'll be clothed in white raiment and he will not blot out our names from the book of life. But like those who were in the church in Sardis, Jesus tells us that if we do not overcome, if we defile our garments, and if we refuse to confess Jesus before men, he will refuse to confess us before his father and before his angels. He will deny us, brothers and sisters. I understand how this is going to be extremely hard for some to accept and even harder when these things actually start happening. When people who believe that they were never supposed to be here start being persecuted. When people who thought that they were going to be raptured out of the world before all hell broke loose on the earth, start seeing the things from the book of Revelation unfolding and start seeing the things that the Bible says men's hearts are going to fail them for those things which are coming upon the earth. The people who have believed the pre-trib scenario could very easily fall away. I'm telling you now to give up that doctrine. Give up all doctrines of men. Follow Jesus Christ and his commandments. Separate yourself from the world. There's no dual citizenships in the kingdom of God. You cannot be a member of the kingdom of the world and a citizen of the kingdom of God. It's not possible. We are supposed to be set apart holy. It is possible to be set apart and holy. Righteousness is possible. It's not possible with our flesh, but it's possible if we will deny ourselves daily, take up our cross, and follow the teachings and commandments of Jesus Christ. Then, friends, we will be living a righteous, holy lifestyle, and those who wonder why they've never felt like they were filled with the Holy Spirit, will all of a sudden begin to see that they are now walking in the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit. Once they have started living, set apart, holy, spirit-filled lives. There is no way to be spirit-filled without being set apart. There is no way to have... The Holy Spirit fill you without being holy. If the Holy Spirit is in you and you're full of the Holy Spirit, then you will live a holy life. You will be holy. You will strive to be holy. Will you fall? Will you fail? Sure. But when you fall, when you fall, that Holy Spirit that resides within you will convict you. He will chasten you and you will repent. You will not be able to live with yourself if you don't repent. Friends, if you are able to sin without blinking, without conviction, then I would fall on my knees and cry out to Jesus. I would cry out in repentance. Guys, I've been going for over two hours and I was not supposed to go near as long tonight because I started late. And I also have said that I was going to shorten the programs up so that uh, people would start watching them to the end. Now, there are uh, a lot as far as those who actually watch the program, who watch all of it. But 
in the scheme of things, they are few. Why are they few? Because we are few. The way is narrow. The gate is narrow, and the way to the gate is narrow, and there are few who find it. And, you know, I'm not saying anything about my teaching, my preaching, or my show, but I, have, I want to say this to you guys. I've had a lot of people say something to me about my three-hour-long programs or my two-hour-long programs. Let me tell you something, if you can't sit and listen to a two-hour long sermon, if you can't sit and listen to a three-hour long teaching when there's 24 hours in the day and this, these things are recorded, then how do you expect to live a holy, righteous life following the teachings of Jesus Christ? How are you going to give your entire life to Christ if you can't spend a few hours watching a program teaching Jesus Christ and his commandments and teachings. Now, I am not even close to the only one teaching these things. And I am not saying that you have to listen to me to be a Christian. The farthest thing from it. What I am saying is that we need to dedicate our lives to following the teachings and commandments of Jesus Christ. We need to live holy, live righteous, and we will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we will see the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, for those of you who are just joining, I seriously urge you to go back and watch this from the beginning. This was a Revealing Prophecy episode, and tonight's episode was about the power of the persecuted church in the tribulation, the power of the persecuted church in the last days how they will have the same power as the, uh, the apostolic church, the church in the book of Acts, the first and second century church, the first, second, and third century church. There is a very good reason for that, and that is simply because persecution equals purification, and the church who is already persecuted and already living in tribulation, they already see the power of the Holy Spirit. They see the things that the church of Acts saw, that the church during the tribulation will see. Brothers and sisters, I thank each and every one of you for joining me tonight. I always look forward to the time when I can come on and share the things with you guys that the Lord puts upon my heart to share with you. I have been supposed to do a program on the new IFB for two weeks now, and I didn't do it. But the reason I didn't do it tonight wasn't because I'm not doing it. It's because the Lord really put it upon my heart through various things that I've been shown throughout the day, things that people have said to me, and things that I have seen in other people's teachings that really, really has laid it on my heart to teach the kingdom as much as possible. Not only to teach the concept of the two kingdoms, but to teach the power of living and walking in the kingdom the way that Jesus Christ teaches us to. There are so many people who are not being set free from so many things. Whether it be physical illnesses, mental illnesses, addictions, whatever. The reason for that is, it's very simple. Very simple. You, those people, when I say you, I'm talking to people, that I, the type of people I just named. It's the people who have given more to the world than they have to God or to Christ. It's people who have merged the things of this world into the kingdom of God. It's people who try to merge the world and the church. If you completely surrender and completely repent these, of these things, whether it's something you need to repent of or something you need to surrender to the Lord, if you would do that, and live righteously. Decide, hey, 
The Bible actually does say this. So I've got to forget about what my pride says. Forget about what I've been taught. Forget that it's been pounded in my head since birth to be a patriot of the United States or whatever uh, nation you live in. And put that patriotism mindset that you have in here to the kingdom of God. Imagine, imagine how the church could reach the world if those in the church were as patriotic about the kingdom of God as they are about being Americans. I'm speaking about Americans because I live in America. Brothers and sisters, I love each and every one of you. I truly do. Until...